All right, how's it going, everybody? Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Thanks for tuning in to the Phil Talk Sports Podcast. Myself and Nick Rice here on this cold Tuesday for both of us. It's starting to feel like holiday weather for a change. Uh, Christmas is not for a few days as we record this, uh, but for one of us, Christmas actually came early. And I'm going to let Nick jump right into it. We're going to jump right into our first topic because he has been frothing at the mouth for like three or four days to talk about this when it when it when the news dropped he's like i want to do a podcast right now and i wasn't (laughs) home or we probably would have done it just then so nick thanks for being here appreciate your patience let's get right into it your early christmas present the chargers fire brandon staley finally the floor is yours my friend yeah you know um i told my family that they could stay outside in the bitter cold you know it might even might actually run into brandon staley out there i gotta get my my two cents in about This dude, you know, this guy stealing an opportunity from somebody who really deserves it. And like here on the Phil Talk Sports podcast, we do not, we do not take pleasure in someone getting fired. We do not do that. But if there was one person in the NFL that did deserve it as a head coach, it was him and him alone. And yes, I bring in Matt Rule in the conversation who got let go. I bring in, uh, shoot. You know, record the records, the record, Bill Belichick, you know, and other guys that are just absolutely underwhelming talent, you know, with the talent they have. This guy had a maybe not a Super Bowl roster, but a very, very, very good competitive roster to go five and nine. I almost have to give an ovation to go along with the 63 points he allowed in three quarters against the Raiders. Congratulations to winning the job as the worst coach in the NFL. Um this is not just a, a Brandon problem, though. This is a uh, Spanos and ownership problem because this entire culture is a mess. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we might get into it at some point tonight, but it reminds me a little bit of Dallas out West where there is a culture, you know, when it's like, oh, my gosh, like another disappointing playoff game, another, you know, humiliating loss. Like, what is the deal? We have a team that's very good. Same story every year. But with that said, Brandon Staley was awful, and he had to go. Yeah, you know, you, you hit the nail on that. You, you, were, you were doing it tongue-in-cheek, but realistically, we don't tend to celebrate when people lose their jobs. Like, we don't really do that. There are times when it's warranted, but that's different than celebrating the fact that it happens. And you mentioned, like, Matt Rule last year. We had Josh McDaniels this year. Uh, the Panthers fired another coach mid-year this year. Um, I'm normally in the camp of like, unless you know immediately who your next guy is and you are already going to begin the process of hiring said person, firing them mid year, I don't tend to tend to approve of because then in some cases, like in Vegas, like the, the interim coach like gets everybody riled around and like the players want to play for that guy and that. Sadly, that interim guy almost never gets the job. So then it auto it like it's a shot to your culture anyway. But I say all that to say Brandon Staley is the perfect example of someone who did need to be fired midseason. Because this is someone who, like you said, maybe not a Super Bowl roster, but given that you're in the same division as Kansas City, you're still expected to do great things. That really shows how talented of a team. You know, we were we were talking in our in our group chat. I think before this game start, we when we were watching the Raider game where they got dismantled, you know, sixty three to was it twenty one. Oh, um, Khalil Mack made a sack, and I put in our group chat like, you know, I always forget Khalil Mack is is a Charger now. Like I don't know why, just something that my brain refuses to record. And mm-hmm. you said that he's leading the league in sacks, so they have like a generational quarterback, the sack leader in the NFL at the time, at least. I don't know what the numbers are as of this moment. You know, just Pro Bowlers all over the place. And they can't get out of their own way. And, and usually when that happens, it's got to be coaching. Yeah, you know, I hope, you know, one of these days with whatever I do, I have the level of confidence that Brandon Staley has. Fourth and 10, down by seven at my own 20-yard line. For this dude to have the cojones to go for it is incredible. And cojones is a generous way of saying This dude thought he knew more than the rest of the NFL. And that's Mm -hmm. what drove me crazy. And I think eventually the Chargers players were like, look at this dude who's never played. This dude who spent four years as a coach. uh, Four years ago was a Division III coach. No shame about rising the ranks. I mean, you know, we've seen plenty of guys do that. But for this dude to say, 
oh, yeah, I know, you know, going for it when everybody in the league is saying who's been here forever, that's a horrible idea, you know, to go along with his, his other coaching decisions. But that was the biggest one. I, as a player, that would rub me the wrong way. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we won a game or two with those decisions, but we also lost uh, several bad games just by a coach going, yeah, I'm going to go for it seven times, you know, and I think, um, it, it's like Dan Campbell level aggressiveness and then tack on, you know, like times 10. Yeah. It, it was just brutal. Some of the decisions and, uh, he had to go because, and that was, that was like the biggest gripe to me, man. You know, just how could you from your own 20 go for these ridiculous fourth downs that drive yeah. me crazy as a player. I just don't know how many games, you know, there's, there's six minutes left. You're down five with the ball and it just chargers lose. Like that's just other oh, yeah. than the one I think it was, I think it was the game against Denver when Wilson like threw a game winning pass that got popped up in the air and you guys intercepted it. That was like the only one score game uh, I remember Vikings. you guys winning. Viking, excuse me, it was Kirk Cousins. Yeah. You're right, but that's the only game that I recall you guys winning in a close matter. And when you and lose that was close the game games, where we went for it on fourth down at our own twenty five and missed, right. and we should have mm -hmm. lost that game because of that yeah. horrible decision. I think when you lose a lot of close games, the difference has to be coaching. That's like if it's if it's consistently a close loss, it's usually a situational thing or just your philosophy in general. So, you know, this is someone like I said, I don't always agree with firing mid year, but this is this is a dictionary definition on why you would fire somebody mid year. Who the interim coach is right now, it doesn't matter because Herbert's not, you know, he's out for the year, right? Yeah. Is he's not coming back. Is, is He's not coming point? back. We are 12 point underdogs this Saturday against the Bills at home. Yep. Ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ridiculous. Yeah. And you know, to 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 give up 63 to the to your a division rival who themselves have an interim coach going on right now. It mm -hmm. was the perfect epitome. And and that's a team that scored zero points the week before. <laughs> you have to you have to try <laughs> to not score any sort of points in an NFL game with NFL players and NFL roster. So I, yeah. you know, in our, in our picks thing, I know it was Easton stick that, you know, that was playing, you know, three time, four time national champion at the FCS level going into those picks. I'm like, all right, well, the Raiders scored no points. So maybe. And I also thought like, if they're for some reason trying to save Brandon Saley's job, the players, they're going to show out to a team that's not scoring points. And to see the, the complete opposite of that, showed you that, you know, the guys wanted him to go to. I'm not saying they laid down because you're still like a grown ass man out there on the field. So I don't <laughs> yeah. I don't say that they're like, oh, we're gonna let them score 63 points. I think that would be an insult to your players if I thought that. But it mm -hmm. it, it was just time, man. It's been time for a couple weeks. But this was the I think the only reason he wasn't fired last week, here's my theory, it was a short week and that's just unfair to the organization to get that interim guy in on like five days notice. So I think yeah. you would have. I would think you would have been fired the week before had that not been the case. I think if the Chargers only lost by like twenty, I think he would have been around the rest of the year, which is a shame. And I wouldn't even even been sure had if he was going to get fired. Like if the team instead of five and nine now, but if they finish the year like nine and eight or eight and nine, even with this incredible roster, I think they still would have convinced themselves. I mean, shoot, it took all you know. It took until afternoon here Pacific time on Friday for them to make that choice. Yeah. He finally pulled it. I think they they were looking for any excuse, especially considering blowing the type of lead they did against Jacksonville. Yeah. This I think this ownership did really desperately did not want to make this move, even though it was painfully obvious all year, even since last year. And uh, I forget who was calling for his job in the middle of last year. Was it you? Was it Hank or someone? That I've heard, like, oh, hey, I think he should go last year. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, it was time. I, that might have been Hank because I tend to give, you know, like a little, and like you guys are winning games. You guys made the playoffs. So, like, I don't think I would have called for it. If I, oh, I mean, yeah. if I did, it's, it's totally possible. But like, if he, like you said, if they only lose by 17 or something or 21 or whatever and they don't, you know, fire him, I think that comes down to, you know, the Chargers ownership has always been notoriously cheap. Getting rid of yep. a head coach is not a cheap endeavor because you end up paying them a large chunk of what you owed them for no return of literally, I'm paying you this money to not coach my football team. So, yeah. like, that's a notoriously cheap organization, unfortunately. So I, I think that comes down to it as well. 
And the last time we spoke, you know, I, I threw it out there as a just a, a curveball to you that like what percentage would you give of like Belichick coaching your team next year? And I think you gave it like a fifteen percent or something yeah. close to that. What, what what would you put it at now? Well, similar to that, um, I'm sure you got, you, you're you know considering what happens, have that thing cropped up. I said like a couple weeks ago that I think Bill Belichick they mutually part ways this year. Then after a year. Um, Belichick just decides to, to hang it up and not mm-hmm. coach anymore. Um, I think we'll see his last game in a couple of weeks, but I'm not super confident in that because I'm hearing rumors to the commanders or the Bucks or the Chargers. So right. I wouldn't be shocked if he keeps coaching on another team, but I, I'd give 15% would be generous. I don't see him doing that because it's too much culture to fix in too little of a time. And our cap situation is a complete nightmare. I mean, we'll mm. be like seventy million over the cap next year. Like that is a nightmare to figure out next year. No matter who our coach is, I think we're going to be pretty bad. Do you have any feelers out or or heard anything or like anyone that you think they're looking at? Uh, not at all. I mean, no. you'd think by this point, like oh Ben Johnson or oh you know another assistant. Nothing. I mean, the only thing is. And it's maybe it's more Twitter comments, but Jim Harbaugh. And to me, that's a pipe dream. I don't see that. Yeah. I don't know that I want that can of worms personally. <laughs> yeah. I'd take Belichick over him. Mm. And I mean, it's an attractive job because it's in LA. The roster's there. You have your quarterback. It's really like a, you know, it might, maybe it's not, you know, maybe they're not on third base ready to be, you know, sack flied in for a home run, but or a, a point, but like, they're probably on second, you know, they're, they're second with a big lead to use a baseball term. Like that it's as close to a turnkey operation to be successful as you can. Yeah. You, you have to just kind of use the draft picks that you have. You don't have a lot of cap freedom. You're going to let some of these guys go, but like if you, I don't know what coach that I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. Cause I'm kind of rambling. It's, it'll be the number one coaching opening at the end of the season. In my oh opinion. yeah. Yeah. Usually a lot of the bottom opportunities are open, you know, but this one, I'd say either middle of the road or upper half of, yeah. you know, teams like, hey, if I were to pick a team, I'd like to coach. Yeah. The Chargers would be among the better ones, even with the Chiefs in that division. Yeah. I mean, Vegas is open. Washington will probably be open. Carolina is open. Uh, the Bucks can the Bucks might make the playoffs. So that might make it a little more confusing, like. Right. New Orleans could be Atlanta is more than likely going to be. So like there's going to be options, but I, I still put that if it's not at the top, like you said, it's in the, it's in the top half, you know, without a doubt. Right. Yeah. And you know, I've been, uh, Keyshawn brought this up, Keyshawn Johnson, the SBN about how they did Anthony Lynn as dirty as they did to think after all these years of, of about the last dozen or so years, I mean, I, I, to this day, I, I'm feeling, man, Anthony Lynn wouldn't have been. At least I feel like he would have had the defense ready. Brandon Staley was a defensive coach. And they would have had the, you know, a little more of a culture. You know, I didn't I didn't love his, his decision-making either. But, um, yeah, you know, you hit, it hit the turnstile enough times and all of a sudden coaches are like, well, I don't want to go there because, you know, granted they keep guys around a little bit, but, you know, the culture is just – this is not a job where it's like the culture is almost set, you know, and while there is talent, I, this is not an easy turnaround. This, this right. will be, a, this is a tough turnaround. Come from a charger guy. I mean, you look at it at like Carolina, right? That, that owner is trying to run his football team the way he runs his businesses in, in the like corporate world, which is why he's fired. It. Cause like <laughs> we, in a normal business, if the CEO's not getting it done. You fire him, you bring a new guy in every mm-hmm. year, if you need, every quarter, if you need to. But yeah. that doesn't happen in sports. So, like, Carolina job, even if someone wanted it, they're like, I'm on a very short leash. I will say mm-hmm. whoever gets his charger job, the fact that it took this much for Brandon Staley to get fired is encouraging. Think, it's encouraging for the for the hire because you're like, I'm going to be able to, like, I don't want to make mistakes, but if I do, like, the, the leash is there, I think, at least a little bit because they're mm-hmm. not going to fire another guy really early if they don't have to. So I think that's – you know, that might be so they might be the it could be for the wrong reasons. I think it's for monetary reasons, but I think they're the most patient of the openings as well. Yeah, man. And, and we were, you know, we were flirting with Sean Payton. We're bringing him over and we were, right. you know, telling telling them just how great the facility is. And then we hire this dude. 
And we see Sean Payton turning around that franchise, even with Russell Wilson and what he has, what he is. Right. So unfortunate, you know, th- this time we'll get it right. We, we swung and we missed about five times with coaches, but this time we'll do it. Well, I, I hope so. Sounds like you're due though for a good hire. And it's funny. We talk about how bad this guy was. I look at his coaching record, 24 and 24. He's exactly yeah. 500. It's just because it, it must have started pretty good and then just tailed way off. You know, like you said, four and nine just to start this year um, yeah. after, after you know, making the playoffs and that terrible um, playoff collapse, which is really, I don't know, maybe they just never recovered from that because you don't just walk away from like a 28 to three or whatever it was lead like they oh, had. Oh, yeah. And what was frustrating too, I brought up the fourth downs. This guy would go to the media and go, you're not going to ask me that question anymore about whether or not I'm doing my job as a defensive. Like, who are you to tell yeah. reporters what to do? Same story with the Jaguars game where he's saying, oh, yeah, we're all, we're like, I get it. We just lost, but we're on to next season. I'm like, listen, coach. <laughs> all right. We can see right through your, your shallow yeah. ego. Yeah. Crazy very few stuff. coaches get to like beat up the media like that. Like, <laughs> If if someone asks like Belichick Popovich can do that, sure. But if Belichick gets asked a question, he doesn't like. He just like stares at the reporter <laughs> until they retract and apologize. So like <laughs> he's one of the few people. Like Mike Tomlin, he takes no shit. Right, he has no problem just being mm-hmm. like, no, like no, that's not true, and you're dumb for asking it. Like he's gone yeah. that route a few times. Andy Reid has the respect. You know, he doesn't get annoyed. He was annoyed recently with the you know, Tony offsides thing, but like, he's not someone that that slashes out in the media, but like very few guys have earned the ability to just like own the media in their towns. And one Mm -hmm. LA is a different animal, regardless you're a second class citizen in LA and you're not good. So you are not one of the people that get to push around because, and that media is different than any other place in the NFL. Cause it's like half paparazzi and half sports writer. So it's not, you know, most other places it's like 99% sports writer. These other guys just go in there for like the the human interest stories, which has got to be annoying as well. Yeah, Mike Tomlin uh, walking his way to the locker room at halftime, and he's like, "Hey, coach, can I get an autograph?" And he's like, "I'm working, damn it!" Yeah, <laughs> just walks right by. <laughs> Love that. But, yeah, Brandon I mean, Saylor does that, and and he's getting hit. So yeah, you know. absolutely. So uh, do you feel better? I know I know it took a couple days to get this you know this platform to get it off your chest, but I hope I hope uh, you got everything out. Uh, I feel better in some ways and I feel worse in other ways. Looking at all these teams I could have been a fan of, you know? (laughs) So, oh, well, that's the, uh, that's the, the pain of, you know, I I think everybody feels that way at one point or another. It's like, why did I pick the team that I picked? And there's always an obvious (laughs) reason why. And it's like, no matter what team you're a fan of, you're going to feel that at some point in your life, you know, New Englanders thought it was never going to happen that they'd feel that way again. And now here we are. So, you know, it's, it's, it's everyone's turn to come around, but uh, now if you, if you guys don't mind, it's, it's my turn to, to get some stuff <laughs> off my yeah. chest because the Eagles have lost three games in a row. And here's the deal. Losing to the 49ers kind of knew that was going to happen. They've had us circled on their schedule. Literally. I don't know if you remember seeing it, Nick, when they dropped their schedule, their graphic, they literally put a bullseye around the Eagles head on their official schedule graphic. So I knew they were coming for our head. We were banged up. We hadn't played particularly great. We, we were playing a tough stretch of our schedule. We were squeaking by in some games. That happens. The Cowboys game, we beat the Cowboys once earlier in the year. Division opponent. The past, you know, out of the past decade, we've probably split with them six or seven of those ten. They probably swept us once or twice. We probably swept them once or twice. But more likely than not, it's a split series, you know, somebody gets a win here, somebody gets a win there. It sucks. Never fun losing to the Cowboys, but it's something you could stomach because everything was still in front of you. But to lose to Drew Locke, if this game had Geno Smith in it, I'm only a little annoyed. But to, to lose to Drew Locke in the fashion that you lose, this is a football game that was 60 minutes. The Eagles were winning this game 59 minutes and like 32 seconds of it. They literally – that is the epitome of, of dropping it at the end right there. And Welcome to Brandon Staley's world, by the way. Absolutely. I know how you felt for a change. But <laughs> yeah, for this to, to be in the situation where you're up – was it uh, four? You're up four, like six and a half minutes to go. You're moving the ball, and you decide to throw it deep to Quez Watkins, the one guy on our team that doesn't battle for deep balls – 
Like if you throw that ball to, to AJ Brown and it gets intercepted, you live with it because AJ Brown's mm-hmm. one of the greatest receivers in the league currently, especially going yep. deep. You throw that to 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 uh, Smitty, you know he's he's one of the most acrobatic and, and athletic players out there. You live with that. Uh, if you throw it to Dallas Goddard, do you think maybe he's going to muscle and and like? There's even been clips of like he got pulled down on that interception, but Quez doesn't fight for the ball, so it's not going to get called because he doesn't look like he's being held. He just gives up on the play. So to to go for a knockout shot when you don't need to, I don't know if that was the call. I don't know if that was Jalen Hurts playing hero ball, but that that was the worst I felt as a fan of this team in years. And I, I'm not someone that – you're going to lose football games. I know some people look at the NFL the way other people look at college and they think every game is a disaster. You're going to lose games. It's going to happen. But this one is inexcusable. Luckily, the last three games of our schedule are New York Giants, Arizona Cardinals, New York Giants again. So those are three very winnable games. And the great part is if you win out, you still beat the Cowboys in um, in the tiebreaker scenario. Yeah. So that's what you got to look forward to. All respect to Tommy DeVito. His shine's kind of coming down. You get You get him twice. You do have Kyler Murray, but that team's not playing that much better than they have all year. Um, it'd be inexcusable not to win out at this point to, to let this game. And granted, this game was in Seattle. It is hard to win in Seattle. And if it was Geno Smith, I'd have a much different tone, but to, to lose to drew lock, in a, in a, it was a lot like the jets game. The same thing with that is if you don't throw that pick at the end and you run the ball two more times and then punt, like you're making Zach Wilson go 90 yards, which drew lock did do to, to uh, throw the touchdown to that rookie receiver. Uh, but it was just so out of character. Like mistakes were made in the game, but also like they got they got pressure and everything. But it, it's uh, you know it's just it's disappointing. This game of all of all things um, was disappointing. The other two losses, even the Jets, as annoying as that was, I can stomach those. This one I, I don't stand for. This, this is the worst loss we've had in a long time. Do you feel better? <laughs> a little bit, because I've had this swirling in my head, and we've talked in the group chat a little bit. But that's this is that's as bad as it gets. As uh, on the other side of it, you know, as a, as a neutral observer of that game, what did you take away from that? Yeah, well, I took away okay, first game with Matt Patricia, the new DC. The defense should be playing a little bit better, especially right. with Shaq Leonard. And you're watching more closely. Did he play much? He's played. He's played more and more, like that from that first game. So he was out there, but you know, it's. I don't know that he. It wasn't obvious when he was out there. Let me say that he kind of blended yeah. in. Yeah. Uh I was a little let down with the defense as much as the offense. I get mm-hmm. it. You know, hurts those some of those decisions you, you would rather him not make, especially this late in the year, where at least yeah. you can justify, hey, it's September. We're still figuring out guys and lineups and stuff. This is really feeling like it, it's, you know, we don't want to say it, but those that Steeler team, that 11-0 Steeler team from a few years ago, we, we don't want to say it. Mm-hmm. Um, and this team, to me, isn't that bad, no. you know. But, no, because the Steelers weren't coming off a, a Super Bowl appearance the year before. So you, you know right. there's, there's, there's proof of concept that this team works. That's the difference. But, right. of course, people, people are going to make the comparison. I understand. And even if they weren't coming off the Super Bowl, this team, you know, is not – it's better than that. Right. But it is it is feeling a little scary as if that was a little fraudulent. And I get it. The schedule they had was impressive. The, the wins yeah. they had against the teams they had. But it does feel a little bit like they need to improve, not just a little bit. They really need to figure quite a few things out. Yeah. Um, game plan is a little bit of it. Defensive execution is a good amount of it. Um, and to be honest, this was one of those not very good Jalen Hurts games, start to finish. He just yeah. did not look like he usually does. Because I love Jalen Hurts, and you know, not as a Charger fan, we have Justin Herbert, but I really liked his decision making, his his demeanor. Every game, his press conference, to me, that makes a difference. Mm-hmm. You know, like maybe being on your side, it, it is a little frustrating, but. Being on the Charger side, seeing them execute late in games, beating the Bills, you know, in overtime with the late game execution and all those, you know, narrow wins, that's valuable. And I think in the playoffs that will bode well. And I trust them because they have a quarterback that's going to rally the troops. And I I know he he's going to be as prepared as any guy is going to prepare and play as hard 
is any guys going to play. And I can't say that about teams like Dallas, maybe even team a team like Detroit. I guess it's too early to tell. We haven't mm-hmm. seen them in the playoffs. Right. But I can trust Jalen Hurts that in those late game moments, he's going to deliver. So I wouldn't count this team out yet, even though it looks looks pretty bad right now. I mean, it's I wasn't a Jalen Hurts guy from the start. Like we had that whole conversation many, many, many times. Um, the guy's a leader. Like there's no doubt about that. And I don't know what it is this year. You mentioned like his demeanor and stuff. It's just been it, it was looked at as like a laser focus thing for a while, but now it's just like, dude, you got you gotta show some type of emotion at some point. But the positive to it all, at the end of the day, I touched on it a second ago, I'll reiterate it now. Our tough part of the schedule, the gauntlet, is now over. And the Cowboys have like a mini version of that. Because at this point, that's what it is. It's, it's a race with the Cowboys to get the number two seed, unless the Niners somehow trip up and you, you steal the number one seed. But like, we got the, the next three easy games. They just had the Bills. I think they have the Dolphins. I forget the other two teams they have. But they have a, they have a much tougher last three games than, than us. So that's that's a benefit to us, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, this is a – I mean, the, the race for the two seed is is interesting, and the Philadelphia took care of business. But this is also uh, um, going into the playoffs feeling a little bit different. But I've just seen too many times teams kind of limp their way down the stretch and, uh, you know, turn it on later, especially a championship football team. I, I find it almost ill-advised to go – This team that proved it last year, bringing back, you know, Super Bowl caliber players, you know, all the guys that they brought back, even from the 2017 team, like Brandon Graham is still on that that club, right? Yeah, there's like six players that are still. Fletcher Cox and Jason Kelsey and these guys that have been through the trenches. I just find it ill-advised, especially this year. San Francisco is really good, but outside of that, I trust them over the field. I mean, Tampa, Mm -hmm. Detroit, Dallas. Whether they get that one seed or not, mm. I mean, or two seed or not, it does feel important if you play Dallas because of yeah. the insane home road splits for them. But outside yeah. of that, I'd say you get in, you know, you figure things out against these three lowly opponents. There's nothing quite like, you know, beating up a uh, Chris Broussard reference, a tomato can to make you feel mm. good about yourself. That'll feel pretty good to go three weeks. We get a chance to try some things out, feel good about ourselves. I still think the the Eagles will be just fine. It's funny with you know you mentioned the people that are still on from the 2017 team. Uh, there's six guys, two on offense, two on defense, two on special teams. So it's as even that? a split as you get. You know you got you got Kelsey and Lane Johnson. Uh, you got Brandon Graham and Fletcher Cox, and you got Jake Elliott and our long snapper uh, Devado. So it's funny how that worked out for them. Um, but yeah, so it's again these next three games are really telling because you need to win. You need to win somewhat convincingly just to prove that, you know, th- this is ro- for a team that's 10 and four, this is rock bottom. It doesn't get worse than this. Unless, crazy. You, just, <laughs> unless you just fall off, you know, to, like they said, otherwise they will be compared to that Steelers team because yeah. it, it'll look exactly the same to the untrained eye. So that's, I mean, if you just think about it from this perspective, if the Eagles, you were to say, or someone were to tell you before the year, hey, you're going to be 12, uh, 10 and 4, how do you feel about that? I'd say pretty good. Exactly. And then right. if you say they're going to be 10 and 1, win a lot of close games, and then they're going to lose three, including a pretty humiliating loss to Seattle, who's basically out. With Drew Locke, yeah. Right. It'd feel a little different, but overall, you're still 10 and 4 with some wins against basically some of the best teams in the league. So it just it feels different because the way it's happened this year. So every time the Eagles win, I have this like Eagles polo that I wear to work, right? It's my Victory Monday shirt when they win. And I had a coworker, you know, mention that I didn't wear it today. I was like, yeah, you know, that sucked, but yeah, or I'm sorry on Monday. But like out of 14 weeks, I had a chance to win it. I've gotten to wear it 10, and that's pretty good odds at the end of the day. So like I, I don't like to overreact. I don't I'm not overreacting to it as a whole. Maybe I'm overreacting to this game because it's Drew freaking Locke, which yeah. I don't know why I think and it's not even that guy's that bad. He's just like we should have beat that guy. There's just no right. doubt about it. This is Geno Smith. Geno Smith's a veteran. He's a dog. There's nothing in this league he hasn't seen. If he goes on that drive, that 92-yard drive, and, and throws to a rookie receiver for a touchdown to win the game, you got us, right? Like, that's you You could stomach that from someone like Geno Smith who's been around the block more than once, right? But for it to be someone like Drew Locke to do it, 
of with a team that prides itself on defense, you know, just just not not acceptable. Yeah, I mean, Troy Aikman was saying on the broadcast, hey, Drew Locke missed the touchdown had he thrown DK in stride. They would have scored earlier in the drive. So basically mm-hmm. they scored two touchdowns on that same drive. Right. Um, disappointing for, you know, bringing in the Patricia and all that stuff. Yeah, I was pretty disappointed. Their defense has been a little uh, disappointing all year. So normally when we do these shows, we, we go college football and then we go NFL. There was two very pressing NFL things we wanted to get out of the way early for this episode. So now we're going to back to the future it, and we're going to talk some some college football steps. We're a little bit late to the party here, but it's it's been a minute since we recorded. So we do want to get uh, things known about this. The, the college football playoff has been set and the undefeated Florida State Seminoles ACC champs are not in it. And a lot of people are very upset about it. I'm very upset about it. Uh, it's nothing we haven't seen before. Um, I blame Georgia for all this because. What about Auburn? You blame Auburn? Too? I, yeah, you know what? Really, at the end of the day, yeah, I blame Auburn for all this because if they just play semblance of a defense on fourth and forever, <laughs> none of this is a problem. Yep. You know, and like, granted, you would have ended up with, um, you still would have ended up with five undefeated because, or I'm sorry, because. Te- no, Texas is twelve and one, so it would have just been it would have just been easy. We got four undefeated. We're putting all in. Sorry, Liberty, you had literally the worst schedule. Like I, I don't like to play that G five Power Five bias thing, but mm-hmm. out of one hundred and thirty three D one programs, Liberty had the one hundred thirty third hardest schedule, so or easiest yeah. schedule, whatever, whatever makes sense there. That's so like crazy obviously of all, yeah, yeah. That, that is insane because they're yeah, it's they got a weird operation down there. We'll uh, more talk for another time, but like. Yeah. So aside they from them, four which, FCS teams, actually, that's pretty big a cop yeah. spin. Yeah. Um, and they're going to, hey, man, if they want to shock the world, like they got Oregon in in, the, in their bowl game. So we'll, let's see what happens there. But um, back to Florida State, you know, obviously quarterbacks injured. injured. Um, they beat a pretty decent Louisville team. They, they basically pitch a shutout against Louisville for, for all intents and purposes and win the ACC. And they're, you know, now they're playing Georgia, who's, you know, pissed that they let a third a chance at a three peat slip away. A lot of guys are transferring out. Guys are already declaring for the draft. Some of these guys, I think, are still playing in the bowl game, but it's hard to tell who's who. Um, but this is, I mean, there, there's lawsuits that are being filed. There's already wow. there's already publications that are if they beat Georgia, they're going to claim them a national championship. You know what? An ironic twist of fate that may be for the people that talked ill about UCF when they claim theirs. But you That's know, right. not. Not everybody is that way. Like, I know plenty of Forge State people that supported what we did, and I would then in turn support them doing that. But just wild stuff uh, for a team that, like, when you think college sports or college football blue bloods, like, you think Florida State. So for them to get this, like, new kid on the block treatment is pretty gross, in my opinion. They're, like, it, it, it was yeah. a, a wild. I get they love Texas and everything, but it's easy. To, and they beat Bama. So, like, they show a great thing there and then Washington you know it's a unique situation but I just think at the end of the day there was enough old people in that room and that picture went around of the committee and it's just all you know your grandpa and his friends, <laughs> yeah you know your citizen the, center you know dozing off at 4 54 in the afternoon but like they they just they, they couldn't stomach not putting an SEC team in is what it came down to at the end of the day which I think is just not right yeah, before before I dive into that part, let's first real re, uh, remember what the BCS was all these years ago and how it most years felt like there's only two teams, one or two teams that are clearly the best in the NCAA. And a huge round of applause for the NCAA admitting, hey, this BCS thing is outdated. It mm-hmm. doesn't, you know, create the best opportunity for teams to win the national championship. And another thing, I don't know if they knew it at the time, but this is going to make more teams feel like they got a shot and over the years is going to add parity to the sport. I can't remember 10, 15 years ago thinking, hey, there's like seven or eight teams that are at least in the conversation that should be competing for a national championship like this year, where the entire top seven or eight absolutely could win the whole thing. Mm -hmm. With that said, Florida State was screwed. This is a ridiculous decision for them to shut out an opponent in the ACC title to go undefeated and not make the playoff against 
Bama, you know, and you know, I, I like the culture of Bama. I like Nick Saban. I mean, I'm not in love with them. San Diego State's my favorite team. But, you know, I do appreciate their success, right. and I do like them to a certain extent. Um, this was ridiculous um, because, to me, if there was ever a year in the history of Saban where you can say, this team deserves to not be in, it was this year because they mm-hmm. did not look like a championship team for big portions of it. They snuck by Old Miss. You know, they lost to Texas relatively handedly. They snuck by Auburn, of course. You know, they beat Georgia. But this was a team that did not look like a championship team all year. And we have been saying, you know, the committee usually will say, all right, if a team in the top four loses, depending on how they lose, we'll bring in a team at five. To bring in a team from eight and, and convince yourself that, hey, the seven team, even though they beat them, still shouldn't get in. And, you know, Florida State, even though they won, should get dropped down the way they did. All the way around, it's ridic- it's it's hilarious and ridiculous, and we're so happy that it's over. I was half surprised that it wasn't like Washington one, Texas two, <laughs> Bama three, Georgia four. Like I would have been less yeah. shocked with that outcome. Uh, Michigan, we're gonna put it seven. Oh, sorry, because, I'm forgetting. You know, right. They didn't win. Like yeah, I'm, I'm forgetting Michigan. You're right, but I mean, right. if we want to open that can of worms. If, if someone would do a goddamn investigation in a timely manner, they should be banned from everything. So that's right. a conversation at some point. Which it would, apparently, we've just forgotten about that, by the way. I, mm-hmm. I don't know what, you know, the, the three-game suspension of Harbaugh in Big Ten play may be the only issue he has, unless they, I don't know. It, like we talked about it last episode, like, t- like kids in middle school are going to, feel the rap of, of the crap they did this year, but that's, that's all another conversation, right. but he's um, still able to coach during the week. He just didn't, couldn't coach on the weekend. He didn't coach of- on the side. Probably, probably texting the interim guy what to, what to do anyway. Yeah. But uh, you mentioned the BCS and you know how most years they claimed you got it right. This is like, there's no other way to say it. So I'm going to just say it this way. Part of the charm of the BCS and it only being one and two is you knew it was flawed. Like every year it was like, these two got in, this team or this team had a chance, but what are you going to do? There's only two spots. That, like It being not perfect was part of the charm. So people thinking that, like, oh, the four was – like I don't, you've probably seen the graphic, like, if the 12-team playoff was this year, like how it would shape out and how like awesome it would have been. But you would have had teams like Penn State and Ole Miss in the mix. And, like, I'm a Penn State fan the way you're an Alabama fan. Like, I support – I hope they win every game unless they play yeah. UCF or something. But, like – you know, they're, they're, they weren't on that level. And, like, they might win a New Year's Six still. But it's – the 12 is going to eliminate these sort of issues. But there's still going to be pro- – it's like the, the March Madness, right? We we watched that show where it's, like, the last four in and the last four out. Yeah, and people are still upset always. that they're, they're 71st in the country. And they're like, we got snubbed. I'm like, no, you didn't. Win a few <laughs> more games. You know, so, like, no matter what you make the magic number, there's people that are going to feel they're snubbed. But when you're undefeated, I'm sorry, you get in. When you're in a Power 5 conference, which is what people have always pumped their chest about until now, and now there's, like, degrees of Power 5 conferences, which is just ridiculous. So, like, I'm glad we agree on this. But, I mean, especially as someone that supports Alabama, this is not a team that deserves it. And in other years, if Alabama's quarterback would have got hurt, they're still putting him in because they're Alabama. Yeah, Ohio State with Cardell Jones. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where it, it – all I think almost all of this gets resolved if you say 12 team playoff, you you get every power five, your champion gets in, and then there's however many wild cards, and then one or two of the non power five champions mm-hmm. get in. And that solves this whole thing where we yeah. have the committee here where it's like no matter what, I mean, the committee this year couldn't have picked a worse <laughs> mm. it, to me, other than, of course, the top, the obvious Michigan and Washington. Outside of yeah. that, it's like they couldn't have picked one that pissed off more people. It's like, all right, we're going to piss off every group around the country <laughs> with our decision. So, um, yeah, crazy to me. Um, but that's how they should do it. Uh, Phil, do, do you know if they are doing it that way or are we still going to have these old geezers make decisions on behalf of these colleges? It's probably still the geezers as far as I know. But, like, with 12, it's harder to screw up. They'll find a way. I'm fully confident that they're going to find oh, yeah. a way. But it's it, it'll it solve this issue, but they'll, they'll just be, they'll be other issues. And to me, like, grant all these teams won their conference. But if you, as I've said for years, as I've pounded my, you know, this desk many times, 
if you just make a requirement that you have to be a conference champion, a lot of this stuff goes away because the conference championship games become pseudo playoff games. You could yeah. cut it. If you had to win a conference title, you could do six and one and two get a first round by and then boom, mm-hmm. you're done because then that Georgia Bama game, that's a playoff game anyway for the SEC championship. The That Michigan Ohio state game, that's a playoff Washington, Oregon playoff. You know, now that Texas is in the SEC, it'd be different, but you know, the, the Oklahoma, if, if both teams have one loss, like, the winning team could still get in. And I think that's all they ever need to do. I said last time, and I'm going to stick by it, 12 is going to feel like too much. I think to jump from four teams to 12, yeah. it's going to seem a little oversaturated. Eight but was definitely be- the move. Six or eight was definitely Six or eight. The move. It's going to feel oversaturated, but we're going to say, hey, at least it's better than what we had. I think at the mm-hmm. end of the day. But that's gonna yeah, happen. but, you know, it is scary because we were saying, oh, four for sure is better than two. Yeah. So, Yeah. We'll Tough. See. And, no, and no, it, what's ironic is this year, if it was two, I think we would have all been happier. I agree. Before that got in. If this was the order, if we had to lean on them and FSU was out, like, shoot, let's just do Michigan and Washington. Mm. And then, you know, whoever wins, wins. Yeah, no, I, th- I think you're right. I think that's actually how that would go down. So, you know, we, we touched on some of these bowl games. Uh, bowl season is upon us. Um, I'm doing decent with the picks right now. I think I'm like six and two out of all the games that have been played. So nice, I'm doing all right nice. there. Um, have you been catching any bowl games or what's your, what's your viewing habits been? Not, unfortunately, not quite yet. I'm, I'm actually, I just took off my party hat with Brandon Staley. We do not root <laughs> for guys getting let go. We don't, but I just happen to be partying with Staley all, fired all over my walls here. So makes sense. Makes yeah, sense. We'll, we'll get around to it. There's been some interesting stuff though. You know, fam, you wins the celebration bowl. They, uh, they finished How the about year. That? The, the 12 formats and... of HBCU football. They've turned things around over there. In Tallahassee. 12, 12 and one, a surprising win over. Ha- so Howard was winning a lot of that game. And I, I was from like the second quarter on, I was glued to this game and I saw a graphic they put up. Um, and I, I know you're, you're a Cookman guy and I live in Cookman country. So this isn't necessarily like, enjoyable to say but they put up a graphic to put them into perspective they won five trophies this year because they won the division the conference the florida classic um the celebration bowl and by way of the celebration bowl they get to claim the hbcu national championship so that's five trophies in one year that's so, five but like two of them are the exact same thing celebration bowl and hbcu title that's kind of what it is right i guess it is but you have to like just i don't know it's a little confusing but they had the graphic and it looked cool. That's all I know. Check, check their Twitter. So, and like I said, if they're used to being the doormat. So if this is going to be, and like, they've been good the past couple of years, we've definitely seen this coming. Um, but one thing I thought was interesting, you may have an answer to this, not to put you on the spot, but like they were 12 and one and that Howard team was only like six and five. So is that, wow. is the uh, swack or meet whichever one it is? Is that just a much more balanced conference and they all beat up on each other? Yeah, way to put me on the spot there. No, um, I, did, I there, mean, I assume that's what it is. Like, yeah, there was a good amount. To win of, your conference at six and five is is wild. Yeah, good amount of jostling. Uh, Bethune did a three way tie uh, back when I was working there mm-hmm. uh, many years ago uh, at seven and four. So it's okay. possible. Sure, but um, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure as much as I used to. But uh, yeah, FAMU was was kind of hung in the MEAC and Bethune kind of switched to the SWAC. Mm. And to me, that kind of hurt them a little bit because now they're recruiting more in the South Midwest, more Texas. They're playing a lot of teams from Bama and, and yeah. Mississippi when they used to, you know, just recruit the seaboard, which is where the conference was. So right. um, I think that all movement is creating a new, you know, difference in powers and, you know, take note, uh, shoot, even, you know, in the, Big 12 with UCF, but just in general with all these teams switching. Yeah. It's going to take a little bit after the reorganizing of chairs to figure out, okay, what teams are going to be good, you know? Yeah, um, once, so, the, once the carousel finally stops for a minute, like we're going to figure out who who can swim in these new waters and who can't. Yeah, sure. the HBCUs did the turning of the chairs a couple of years ago. The right. FBS just did it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, take notes because there's – You'd be surprised, like these these traditional powers. All of a sudden, Howard. I never saw Howard. Granted, they, as you said, went six and five, but Howard yep. was also one of those teams. They Lower were never level, in the yeah. conversation. So mm-hmm. this is very like new times in HBCU. Changing a conference 
the change is a lot. In, in I the mean, college, there's so. there's only like two at at the D one level, so really it's just flip flopping conferences. You know, there's only only right. one other place you can go. So whatever went into that yeah. story. Um, but just a quick little, you know, again we're like eight games in, nine right now because Marshall and UTSA uh, have kicked off already. Um, but you know, we mentioned that game, the Cure Bowl, which was actually played at UCF Stadium for the first Not time. Right. I felt bad for everybody involved in this because it was just a downpour, mud bowl. Like, everything they painted on the field for the Cure Bowl, the rain had almost washed it away, and you could see all the UCF stuff underneath it. So I just – They worked I so felt hard bad to for, put that together. Uh, exactly, man. And, and, a, and a bowl like that, that all the money goes to cancer research, like, I just felt bad for everybody involved. So, mm-hmm. you know, App State beat them in, in – it was like 13-9 to because nobody could throw the ball because it was just raining Brutal. so bad. That was wild. Uh, Fresno State won with former UCF quarterback Mikey Keene, so good on him winning the New Mexico Bowl. I was watching this one at work yesterday. Western Kentucky beats Old Dominion after being down 28 to nothing, and they came back and won in overtime. So that That's may be great. the story to beat of the bowl season, but uh, UCF plays Georgia Tech uh, Friday night in the Gasparilla Bowl, so that is, that's something I'll be, I'll be looking forward to for sure. But I love it. San Diego State's playing in the uh, the, the unemployment bowl, the uh, <laughs> early recruiting process bowl. So we're looking forward to that. You know, I hear they actually have because signing days tomorrow. They have a really explosive running back on their board that's supposed to sign with them tomorrow. His name's Santa Claus. I've been watching his <laughs> highlights on YouTube. Um, for those that, right. that don't get the joke, check out uh, Nick's YouTube channel, Charger Dude ninety five. He's doing a road to glory with NCAA 14 with a running back name. Only eight years after the fact. After yeah, the hey, man, started. dude, I, I'll, I love me a good road to glory. Like, I don't care. I want I, yours especially because I love all your content. But, like, My I man. love finding random people's, like, oh, you made a corner that went to Marshall? I'm in. I'm watching eight episodes of this. Let's <laughs> do in. it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, check out Santa Claus Journey to be an Aztec. Santa Claus, yep. Check it out, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's uh, – before we get out of here, I got one more thing, if you don't mind indulging me. I, I did something pretty cool. Uh, over the weekend. I'm sure most people of, of a certain age, around our age, maybe a little older, a little younger, are familiar with the uh, classic movie Sandlot, right? The story about friendship and baseball and father-son stories and legends and heroes and how legends get remembered, but heroes never die and all that thing. Uh, as it turns out, the writer and director and producer and narrator, all the same guy, of uh, that classic movie, David Evans, is from my hometown of New Smyrna Beach, Florida. So they decided to do a 30-year reunion because it came out in 1993. We're coming up to the 30th anniversary of it. Decided to do a screening with a lot of the cast members at my old high school. And then the next morning played a celebrity charity softball game with a lot of the cast. Uh, They did Q&As. They did autographs. I'm going to share this with the camera. I brought my DVD copy of it, and I got it signed by many members of the cast. We have... uh, the guy that played Smalls, yeah, yeah, the Timmy and Tommy Timmons uh, twins, and Bertram. And then also Benny wasn't there, unfortunately, but the director signed over uh, Benny there. But just just a really cool situation. Like the screening was neat because, you know, it was like going to a movie theater to watch something, but it's a mo- everyone in the theater has seen the movie a million times. So nobody cares if you talk. Everybody laughed at the right times. Everybody, you know, clapped at the right times. And it's just a really unique story. Uh, situation that you know I never thought would happen and uh, all the all the people were really nice like you wonder what childhood stars like they've probably been doing these kind of conventions with with the crew yeah. for years but never and, meet your stars man never don't I don't do know it. man they, they were all very nice they were all really happy to be there uh and, and it was just it was just really cool and um I don't know I don't know if you have any uh I'm sure you've seen Santa a lot a million times as well uh but just, a million just an all time times- great Minus a million. I'm the biggest eye roll of all the guests you have here on Phil Talk Sports. I'm I'm watching movies, man, from the '90s. I'm just getting around to, to all these classics. Just watched Boys. All right. So you you mean to tell Sandlot me I gotta watch? You mean to tell me you've never seen the Sandlot? Uh, so it's sense. funny that you say that. My my friend Coach Luke, who I do a lot of my movie reviews with, I told him that this situa- this story, this uh, event was happening. He also had never seen Sandlot. It's oh, one of the my goodness. It's an it's just an iconic movie. All right, well, I hate to do this to you, but right here on air, you got homework now. Next time <laughs> I have you on, we got to get your Sandlot review. So all right, we'll Sounds make like that happen for sure. All right, uh, yeah, man, we, we had a lot going on today. I'm surprised we got this in under an hour. But uh, any any uh, closing words before we get before you go uh, download Sandlot to watch? Any any last words? Um, the my last words are. Uh, 
I joked about you during the week once it was announced that, you know, Bama was the fourth team in. Who are you rooting for, Michigan or Alabama, rocking mm-hmm. a hard place? And, um, you know, it, it that game is going to be intriguing because it's two teams that I think a lot of people are looking at as like, I'm not a big fan of either one of these. So, no. Yeah, that that's my closing remarks. What an incredible game we have coming up in the New Year's. I mean, gun to my head, I think what I put in the group chat, I'll reiterate it here. As teams I want to win in descending order, you got um, Washington. That would be cool for Washington. Hey, yes. we're a Pac-12 team. We closed out the conference. The right. conference is history with mm-hmm. the title. I, I'm the same way. So I'll go Washington, Texas, Michigan, Bama in that order. So. What about you? About the same? I mean, you you like Bama. You probably put them at two or three. Or yeah, and, and you know, Texas to me is a little insufferable. Like, oh, we're back. And I oh, like, they are. I they are. They're 100% economy. insufferable, but, you yeah. know, I, I agree. And uh, Wait, I'd we're be not miss- winning with this group of four this year. We're, we're, we're not winning with the team no. with a coach that cheated, a coach that gets all the breaks, you know, mm. and then Texas that is insufferable. So go Washington. Yeah, I was just about to be remiss if I didn't shout out, you know, one of our biggest supporters, uh, Jason Lundgren, big Washington yeah. fan. Hopefully they win it, win it for him. But really, it's Washington versus the field. I don't, I don't like any of these other three. You're like, oh yeah, let's, let's go Washington. I'll leave it. Florida at that. State would have been awesome. You oh, know, hey, they yeah. lost their quarterback, and they're going to prove the world wrong. So definitely, definitely. Yeah. Uh, but that's going to do it here for us, guys. Hope everyone has a great Christmas, and we'll see you after. Uh, happy holidays. So take care, everybody. <laughs>